It's time to go on the record with WRAL News. Thanks so much for joining us for On the Record. I'm Lena Tillette. Ask a Democrat in North Carolina how this year is going for the party and prepare for a deep sigh. First, the gut punch. State Representative Tricia Cotham of Mecklenburg County suddenly switches parties, giving state Republicans the one seat they needed to override Governor Cooper's vetoes in both chambers. And then the floodgates open, transgender restrictions passed, GOP-backed education policies advanced, and the most restrictive abortion legislation in decades in North Carolina became law after the General Assembly overrode the governor's veto. All of that happening within weeks. As furious Democrats tried to make sense of Cotham's party departure, making way for the sweeping changes, one new voice emerged from the crowd. They deserve to know who they're voting for and what they're going to stand for when they're running for office and when they're put into a position of power. And that's not what Trisha Cotham has allowed the voters of 112 to do today. That, folks, is Anderson Clayton, a Person County native and chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Her election win in February made her the youngest state party leader in the country at just 25 years old. And tonight, Anderson is here to talk about the massive challenges that lie ahead for the Democratic Party in North Carolina. Big, big challenges. Thanks so much for joining me. So before we get to your specific plans, I want to talk a little bit about who you are. I think a lot of people want to know, where did she come from? I've read your bio. You went to App State. You work with Democrats in Watauga County. But I want to know about your upbringing and what in your upbringing led you to Democrats and led you to political organizing. Mm. Well, it's kind of funny because I don't know that necessarily growing up in uh, a small town would, uh, would actually lead you to political organizing, right? The two things they tell you not to talk about at the dinner table are religion and politics. Mm-hmm. And I think that I carried that with me for a long time. I actually, I want to be a journalist growing up because I thought that telling stories was the way to really connect people with, um, you know, what was going on in the world, right? And I, I credit Person County and I credit Roxborough and the way that I grew up with the values and the, the foundational belief of what I have that politics is actually supposed to do for people, which just make their lives better. You know, it's not supposed to be, I'm, I'm running to be a politician, it's I'm running to be a public servant. I'm running to do something for my community. And so I feel like that's really how I got led into this. I did go to Appalachian State University, go Nears. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that getting involved when I was a freshman up there with a voting site and Republicans in 2016, when they tried to strip away uh, voting sites across college campuses, it really drove me to say, well, there's only one party that's fighting for more access for the right to vote and the right for me to vote and be part of this political process. And I think that's what just really guided me into it. But it's always because of the values that I had growing up where I was from, right? You know, in a rural area, I think we value taking care of each other. Were your family members Democrats? <laughs> my mom was a Democrat, definitely, okay. and grew up that way. My grandma was a Democrat. My sister's a Democrat. Okay. Um, my dad was the only uh, lone Trump voter, honestly, in my family in 2016. It was a really hard thing for us to all come to terms with. He had three women that he was uh, aligning himself against in some capacity, and um, it took a long time for us to come to terms with why that happened, right? And I think that Donald Trump really spoke to a demographic of people that had felt left behind by government, really didn't see how government worked for them or, Mm -hmm. or even saw them fighting for them. And so I think that it, it was tapped into in that way, the, the righteous anger and rage that rural communities have felt for a long time in this state and also across this country when, it look, when it's looking at how do political parties really impact me and make my life easier. Um, and my dad voted for Donald or for Donald Trump in 2016. He was a Joe Biden voter in 2020 and, okay, and so came out of that. Your message on I your did. Dad. I got to test my message, but I, I joke about it. it comes from working on people. You know, your entire family has to really care about how you vote and how your vote affects your right to do something. And um, for me, you know, my mom is a healthcare worker. My sister is a seventh grade science teacher, and and okay. I work in politics. And we're all women, and we all really care about having fundamental human rights going forward. So let's talk about this bold move that you had to decide to run to be the chair of the state Democratic Party. Democrats didn't want win one statewide race in the midterm election in 2022. It was a bad year for Democrats, objectively, right? What made you say, I want to lead the party now? <laughs> um, 
Because I think I saw the direction of the Democratic Party only really including a, a message for urban North Carolina. And to me, you know, North Carolina has the second highest population of rural voters in the entire country besides Texas. We have really dense rural populations that have uh, black and brown voters in them that, quite frankly, the state party and the Democratic Party nationally, in my opinion, hasn't tapped into before because we've dubbed rural areas as unwinnable or as red and rural and red Republican areas, honestly. And I think that to leave any voter to cede any ground in our state to a party that has fully endorsed white supremacy for me is not something that we should be doing as a Democratic Party. Right. Every vote's worth fighting for, and every person cares about their own backyard and their own community and how to propel it forward, I think. And that's not partisanship. That's just trying to get people engaged in politics again. You beat the incumbent chair, though, who was supported by all the top Democrats in North Carolina, the governor, the attorney general, the entire North Carolina congressional delegation. So that, again, was a bold decision for you to go up against the incumbent chair. And Bobby Richardson said something interesting to WRAL. Um, she said that ahead of the election in 2024, basically that Democrats shouldn't be experimenting with new ideas. Hmm. you being the new idea and your ideas would be new. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they should? Because I think that we haven't really won an election without changing the way that we've been approaching uh, organizing and, and actually getting out and talking to people. You know, politics to me is really divisive right now. If you're a young person in this state and the only thing that you look at every day is your cell phone that tells you that the world around you is doom and gloom and you have no power or agency to impact that. We've got a Republican supermajority in our legislature right now. Even if you vote, it doesn't matter because we're gerrymandered in this state and, and on racially gerrymandered lines in a lot of capacities. And what does your vote actually mean sometimes? And for me, I want to pull people out of that that perspective because I really do believe that your vote matters so much. Your opinion and your voice in your own backyard matters. And the places where you can have the most impact are at the local level. And we've got to encourage people that you, this process, this world is ours to create. It's, it's not the people that are necessarily in power right now. We put them there and we can change that. But the agency, I feel like, hasn't really been expressed to folks. And we've got to change how people believe that they can impact politics again. You've talked repeatedly about going after rural voters uh, what would your message be to rural voters? What have you seen has worked? I mean, I think we have to talk about kitchen table issues again. Right now, rural North Carolina is not sur or living, they're surviving, right? I, people are worried about how do I pay my car payment and my light bill every month, not necessarily, you know, what's, what's coming down the pipe. And I think that for Democrats, we're the party of the future. A lot of the things that we're talking about right now, building infrastructure, right, it takes so much time and it's not necessarily an immediate, I can feel the impact on me tomorrow, but it's that we're thinking about how do we build these communities from here on out. And so the immediate relief that we are giving to communities right now we need to talk about like Joe Biden and $35 a month insulin we need to talk about that and let communities know how to access it I had someone that came to the NCDP the other day and actually knocked on my door and he said I'm, I'm trying to get Joe Biden's $35 a month insulin how do I do that and it's really making this a, a way for us I think to get out in communities and share the message about what's our party doing for you because we're doing so much and our party is the party of helping people we care about folks and that should be the message that we're given every single day no matter where we are in this state and it hasn't been for so long and so you know thinking about the affordable connectivity program that came down from the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's $35 a month off of somebody's internet bill if you're making 200% below the poverty line in North Carolina right now that's a lot of people if your kids on free and reduced lunch right now you qualify for that program it's trying to get you broadband access because we know from the pandemic that so many people that had maybe had broadband access they couldn't afford it or they didn't have good access to it and that's also what part of what this program is trying to address right now and I think that it is it's educating people about that because right now folks don't have time to pay attention to what's coming down from the federal government they only have time to pay attention to how am I getting through my life right now I think a lot of people especially people who are new to this area don't recognize that rural voters did used to be in the Democratic camp though a lot of these blue-collar voters did vote for Democrats and then they felt abandoned by the party so what do you say to those folks I mean I tell them the story about the Democrats have got a um, really educate folks about what happened, I think, when NAFTA passed back in 2007, or well, before that, but also just in the fact that my, my dad was one of those folks in 2007 that lost his job, right, when manufacturing really left North Carolina, and we started to see a, a decline in that, but that started to happen in the early 2000s, right, when we started to see um, jobs shifting more and more down south, but also overseas, and I think that the reality of that is that we never had an economic message that really fit for rural communities after that. We kind of just looked at them and said, okay, now we wait for you to die off, and that's what happened. 
happens. Mm. And the Biden-Harris administration, in my opinion, is the first administration in 50 years, federal administration, that has really said, you know, rural communities, we believe you have a future 50 years from now. And not just one that means that you're, you're it's a one, one type of economic opportunity fits you, right? It, just, it doesn't have to be manufacturing only or farming only. Agribusiness is still the number one economic driver in North Carolina, but it doesn't have to be just one thing that holds your economy together because that's what got rural communities in this in the first place. Mm. We have to talk about broadband access as opening up job opportunity and job creation in rural communities. We have to say, you know, when we're looking at how do we expand and how to revitalize and recommit the notion that rural areas deserve to be here. And I think that that's what this administration has really done. And it's an easy message for me to talk about because growing up in a place like rural North Carolina, folks always looked at you and said, you got to get out of here. Like, what, what job do you have that's left here for you? Young people can't stay in a place that looks like this. And then I'm like, but I wanted to. I wanted to stay in my hometown. And I think that every young person in a rural community should have that option. And the only party that's really trying to solve that problem right now, in my opinion, is the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. All right. Passionate about the rural community. I can tell you get too fired up ahead. We're going to have much more with Anderson Clayton and the future of the Democratic Party in North Carolina. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are here with the state chair of the Democratic Party, Anderson Clayton. And I wanted to run through some of the numbers from the last midterm election because they really were telling. Again, it wasn't a good year for Democrats in North Carolina, even though nationwide uh, Democrats were able to to uh, avoid the red wave that was predicted. So uh, Michael Bitzer with Catawba College put this together. And you can see in 2022 among city voters, turnout was down 3 percent. Among black voters, it was down 6%. Among Hispanic voters, it was down, look at that, 8% compared to 2018. Uh, North Carolina's total turnout was down 51, was rather 51.4%, about 2% lower than the 2018 year. So again, this compared not to a presidential election, but to the previous midterm election, which was a pretty good turnout year. So what do you do to energize the base? That's the key here to get the voter turn up among uh, young voters, among black voters. How do you get that up? I put a lot of, um, honestly, the... I put a lot of encouragement on candidate recruitment this year because I think that's something where the party really hasn't taken a strong lead. You know, we've always said donate, volunteer, get involved. Uh, And my other ask with that this year is make sure that you're signing up to run for office. Um, Anyone can at ncdp.org sign up to be part of a campaign that's trying to make sure that we contest every state house and Senate seat this cycle because Democrats left 44 seats uncontested last cycle across the state house and state Senate. And for me, that meant that we had, you know, areas, Democrats and rural red areas, right, but also across our state that didn't have somebody to vote for. And for me, I really want to encourage folks that we have to be giving a democratic message everywhere this year and that people deserve somebody else up on a ballot, even if we know that the Republican state legislature is gerrymandering our state to the point where we may not have some of these successes in places that we should right now, right? Especially when it comes to successful wins in the terms of state house and Senate seats. But people in those communities deserve to have someone to represent their issues and their values on a ballot. And that means um, making sure that we're running people everywhere across our state. And I should say Republicans will say when Democrats Democrats were in power. They also drew districts that worked to their favor until it didn't, of course, when it switched. I guess the question is specifically, what can you do to get young voters to the polls? I mean, how do you tell them that North Carolina Democrats are fighting for what it is that they're interested in? How do you reach them? Yeah, what I would also say to Republicans on that is, though, you know, we don't think that, I don't think at least that anyone, any party should be drawing those lines. I really do believe it should be an independent redistricting committee. The party has taken that stance. There have been several bills that have honestly been put through or proposed in the state legislature this year to actually make that a reality because we we do know what the circumstances are when there's one party in a political, in a position of political power across the state that does have a supermajority control over something, what they do with that power. And it's honestly abuse it, right? And that's at the cost of voters in our state. So 100% on that. But also, going back to what you talked about with young voters, I think that how we're going to be targeting those uh, folks this year is really trying to energize and, and activate college campuses, but also community college campuses, folks that we really haven't started to tap into or target. You know, the pandemic made it really hard, I think, for, for us to actually activate these schools like we used to and, and really be out and active on them. I really 
want to make sure that we're hitting HBCUs this year in the way of having fellows on these campuses that are talking about the democratic values that we have, but also helping students get registered to vote. Um, A&T is one of the most gerrymandered schools in the state right now for the fact that they are split right down the middle of their campus with 5,000 students on one side and 5,000 students on the other. And how many people know why that happens and why they're like the state right now is trying to disenfranchise young black voters. And so there's a huge education campaign that we have to do, but also an energy campaign of showing folks, here's how Democrats are fighting for you this year. And it's not just this year, but it's every year after that. I think if you talk to past, and I'm just going to be honest with yes, you, ma'am. talk to past state chairs, they would say, yeah, those were our, our ideas too. What's new about what it is that you're trying to do? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's rocket science. What we're saying is that we just actually have to get out on these campuses, but we have to be out there early. And I think it's also, it takes young people to organize young people that are from those college campuses, to be honest with you. One of the things that the party's always done in the past is we take folks and kind of drop organizers into areas or we're not actually creating spaces for folks that are from those communities to be the ones that are organizing them. And I think that's a huge thing when you talk about young folks. You know, I want young people out there talking to young people. And I also want them to see that young people in this party are rising in positions of power. And I want them to see the 25-year-old state party chair and say, hey, that can be me one day, and I have to get involved to make that happen. And that's a huge reality that this party's never really offered to young folks. And I think that the Democratic Party this year has really said we value young voices, and we're showing that by putting you in a, by putting one in a position of power, honestly, to make this case and really put money behind what we're talking about on these campuses, but also not just reaching out to those young folks, right? I think that there's a large percentage of young people that aren't on a college campus right now because maybe that's not the decision that they, that they chose to go in in life, and that's okay. And particularly in these rural areas, I want to make sure that we're reaching out to our our 18 to 25 year olds that maybe didn't choose community college or college in general as an option too. And that's where we really have to reach is on the margins this year. Who are you looking for to run in some of these uncontested races? Again, you mentioned 44. I think a lot of people would be surprised that in 44 races, Democrats just said we lost before even trying. Yeah. Who are you looking for to be bold enough to say, I feel like I can challenge that person? If you've got a vision for what your community should look like 5, 10, 50 years from now, those are the folks that I'm looking for. How do you want to take care of the issues that you really feel are are salient right now in your community, like a housing crisis that we're going through in rural North Carolina at this moment in time, like a, when you're thinking about our water crisis, and when you're thinking about housing and health care and, and education, honestly. If you've got a passion about seeing your community grow and go forward, those are the type of people that I want to run for office. Shana Outlaw is my best and perfect example, honestly, of somebody that never saw themselves in politics before. She sits on the Roxboro City Council right now, and she works at McDonald's full time. You know, she's someone who's a mother in the community, somebody that just really cares about the folks around her and wanted to make her community better. Those are the people that I want to see in in public office right now, the folks that never thought they would. Uh, What do you say to someone who says that Anderson hasn't proven herself enough to be in this position. She doesn't have the relationships with the donors that you will need. You need that money to be able to do all this campaigning. What do you say to that person? I'd say I'm going to work really, really hard to prove myself uh, to anybody that wants to challenge me in this or my ability to make sure that this is the the way forward for our state. I know that we have to dig deep and I know that we have to fight hard for 2023 in our municipal races and also in 2024. But the battle doesn't stop there for our state. And I'm from a place, to be honest with you, that I never expected to win an election in. And it was always about just putting up a fight. (laughs) And Republicans in this state have got to know that we're not going to sit idly by and watch them run our state like they are right now because they're running it into the ground. And so I think that we have to say we're going to be out on the attack in every place that we can be. And we're going to be fighting for folks' votes, Democrats, independents, unaffiliates, Republicans, everybody in between. I don't care. But if you want to see this state move forward, you're going to start talking to the candidates that we're going to have on the ground this year, I think. Anderson Clayton, chair of the state Democratic Party. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk to a political scientist about all we just heard. Stay with us. Joining us now with reaction to what we just heard and insight into how both parties stand right now in North Carolina going into 2024 is NC State political science professor Stephen Green. Professor Green, thanks so much for joining us. So just your big takeaway from what we just heard from Anderson Clayton. Uh, I I mean, uh, it it was great, honestly, in in terms of I I teach a political parties class and what um, what she was saying is is right from from a political science perspective, from someone teaching political parties. This is what the Democratic Party needs to do. And, you know, the the question is how successful that can be, how well they can execute. But in terms of 
uh, reaching out, uh, especially to try and motivate young voters, which, to be honest, is always hard. Um, but certainly making sure that they are competing across the state and not just ceding battlegrounds to Republicans. That's really important to to try and achieve that the, the statewide success they're looking for. How meaningful could inroads into rural communities be with the election in 2024? Right. I mean, it, it's one of those things where, you know, Democrats are winning the big metro areas by a lot. And then we we still have a lot of substantial rural population in this state. And we've just really uh, bifurcated on that where Democrats are so winning the, the metro areas. Republicans are so winning the rural areas. And and it's not a matter of Democrats trying to win the rural areas. It's, it's a matter of trying to, you know, stanch the losses of, of you know, losing some of these areas. Uh, you know, 60-40 instead of losing it 70-30. And you do that across the state uh, and combine that with strength in places like right here in Raleigh and Winston-Salem and Charlotte, et cetera. And that can absolutely make the difference in winning statewide elections. So to not just give up on on rural areas and say, oh, those are hopelessly Republican, uh, I I do think is important. How would you describe uh, state Republican strength right now uh, given the fact that now they're able to override the governor's vetoes and just their position in general with the successes that they've seen this legislative session? Well, I mean, it's 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 strong, right? You look at what they have been able to do in the legislature and override recouper on important matters and, and basically get their way, which is what a, a supermajority will do for you. You know, that said, and uh, I don't want to harp too much on, on the gerrymandering, but it really does matter because the Republicans are able to govern as a as a 60-40 state in a state that's really a 52-48 state. Yes, there is a, a slight advantage Republicans have in our electorate, but it's a pretty slight advantage. And the way the districts are drawn, is, as well as to some degree the natural distribution of, of voters, um, really amplifies that advantage that we see in the legislature. But in terms of, of the parties being competitive on a statewide basis, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say the Republicans have a, have a slight advantage, but it's it's a slight advantage. And in competitive statewide races, um, Democrats can make a, a very strong showing potentially in, in 2024, though, again, it's, it's going to depend on what's happening in the rest of the country. Uh, we, we don't exist in a vacuum here. How would you assess the gubernatorial race? At least what we're thinking, uh, Robinson versus Stein in 2024. Well, I am on the record as saying I think Mark Robinson is a very poor general election candidate for the Republicans. I think if he is the nominee, it will really put them in the hole in trying to win this very important statewide race. Um, I think strategically, pragmatically, Republicans would almost surely be better off without a, a candidate who is so divisive and so leaning into the culture wars. Uh, Republicans have won the governorship in this state with candidates like Pat McCrory, uh, kind of a a conservative but moderate, uh, you know, business friendly Republican. You know, somebody who who comes in, mayor of Charlotte, somebody going to get things done, and and that seems to me uh, to be the template for somebody who's going to succeed. You look at um, uh, Dan Forrest, who mm-hmm. ran as a conservative culture warrior. And was defeated rather, I don't know, handily, but pretty well considering the overall context. And I think Mark Robinson is even more so. So he's got a real challenge there. Professor Green, thank you so much for your insight. And if you have something to say about tonight's discussion, follow us on Twitter or you can find me on Facebook. Leave a comment and share this video with your friends. With daily uploads, there will always be a conversation.